starting 10 minutes late, but we were discussing ways of reducing the program today so that people can stay until the final final session and leave early, earlier at the same time. So this, is why, um, this is why we are 10 minutes late. Anyway, let's start. Let's start uh, right away. The, the first paper session today. And we have Laura Campbell and Richard Powell Paul Jones from the University of, of East Anglia that are going to um, expose us to a very interesting angle. Uh, in, and it's like when, when people think of uh, scientific standards, um, I think the, the first things that come to mind are selection bias, or maybe uh, improving internal validity, or find a counterfactual to prove causality, or, you know. And, and that they, you know, of course there is criticism of RCTs because they're weak external validity, and you know, how shall we use qualitative methods to prove uh, construct validity. But, but something that is, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I've never, um, I've never seen work that addresses repeatability and replication. And so this is, what the session is about. So that I think they will um, they will tell us what's the state of the art in, in, in current in this practice. Uh, so ask, answering questions like are studies replicated? And the the interesting thing is that this is, is a large from different angles. So both technically, in terms of what practices facilitate replication, like data archiving and, and these studies, uh, but also ethically and institutionally. So what are the incentives for replicating studies uh, and, and even psychologically? So what are the systematic biases that uh, make replication unattractive? Okay, so... Okay. Thank, thank you, Laura. Um, I'm just going to say a very brief introduction as to uh, how we got here and uh, why it's the two of us doing this. Um, I met... Uh, Laura in Manchester at the Global uh, Studies Association meeting, and we discovered a, something of a joint interest in ethical issues in development and research um, that were not focusing on protection of subjects. Uh, we, uh, my school were increasingly adopting a medical model of um, um, uh, informed consent as, as the important thing that everybody had to sign up to. And I was uh, thinking about what other ethical issues that were involved in research. Uh, and so we uh, uh, gradually over time developed an interest and we organised a joint session at the year the Development Studies Association meeting in Manchester a couple of years ago, uh, under the title of, as well as the subject, uh, with the idea that there are issues that uh, we should be addressing uh, besides protection of subject and also protection of researcher, which is the main thing that we did. And uh, they were focusing around issues of analysis and reporting, where people didn't have to sign up to doing these in an ethical way. Um, and uh, following the uh, joint session of Manchester, we also had three seminars uh, in which we, one devoted to qualitative methods, one devoted to constant methods, and another one devoted to mixed and longitudinal studies. And some of the works that were presented there, um, well, they're available on the website, the presentations and some papers, but they're also going to be issued progress and development studies in September, October this year. And also there will be a special section of German development studies, we hope, this year. The papers will be accepted, it's just a matter of when they get them scheduled. So, um, I don't want to steal any more of um, Laura's uh, funding. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, her side, which is predominantly around quality materials, uh, and it's sort of ensuring rigour um, in uh, the analysis and presentation <coughs> reporting of uh, quality, quality materials. So I just want to deal with quality. Um, so <coughs> I'll start by saying I'm obviously aware that to some extent I'm reminding people of what they already know. There's a long history of quantitative methods within evaluation, and of course the quality of method methods and methodologies is, is long on discussed. Um, yesterday we had some exciting new conceptual ways to frame the work that we already do, but there wasn't so much attention paid to the quality of the tools that we use and also the quality of analysis. Uh, and this is perhaps I had, I think for some people in the audience, a sort of theory practice gap where they thought about their experience of working with evaluators on the ground and they thought of the exciting new ideas that were being presented here and found it perhaps a little bit difficult to bring the two things together. And of course we know that without 
good data quality underpinning these quite elaborate frameworks, uh, then the framing actually becomes more of a rhetorical device rather than a way of analysing. So in the same way Richard would talk about econometrics and how it's a you can often disguise some very iffy data with some good econometric analyses, and you know, it would obviously be a shame to see that happening in a more qualitative <coughs> way um, with the use of quite complex conceptual frameworks. So yesterday we talked about the activist evaluator, the progressive evaluator, even the well-read evaluator. And today we focus more, I think, on the reflexive evaluator. So I'm going to particularly look at, as Barbara said, this theme of repeatability, replicability, and the extent to which that can be um, sensibly discussed in terms of qualitative research, and that's by looking at archiving and re-studies. So, is it a good time to be a qualitative researcher and impact evaluator? Well, you get to come to great conferences like this, very stimulating, completely exciting people, there's endorsements and gifted, there's a great interest from a number of other bodies. And there's also a growing interest in slightly more sophisticated methods and, and frames. Obviously, we talked yesterday about complex systems analysis, which seem to incorporate qualitative methods in a very interesting way. I've just given a few examples here of very large range of approaches. Um, my concern, of course, would be that practice doesn't match the rhetoric. So, um, as Patricia Rogers said, the range of research designs is typically quite limited. People, um, there's a certain automaticity in the way that people do <coughs> research. Uh, qualitative research tends to come in at the end rather than the beginning, so it doesn't really inform the quantitative component. And it's extremely rare to see qualitative and quantitative data analysed together or even presented together. And that's something Michelle Adato has commented on. And um, something I find even more problematic, and this was um, raised by the lady over there, is that in the, in the most basic sense that you know what was done, or any form of reflection on what was done and the way that that might limit the things of analysis that could be used. Uh, and it's also quite difficult to access the raw data, uh, although, as Julian said, this might perhaps be changing since Diff would have asked them to um, archive their data from the Millennium Villages uh, evaluation. But I mean, this is so new that there are actually no models to enable this to be done. But there are, however, a growing number of mixed methods designs. Um, organisations like 3 and Adobe, and you wouldn't expect to find it in their databases. But I think it's an encouraging sign that organisations that you know, pride themselves on their rigorous approach and perhaps been seen as more oriented, oriented towards quantitative work appear to be showing a great number of um, qualitative studies, many of which are still ongoing. Um, but when you look a little bit more closely, um, I've been trying to draw out case studies to you in the course I teach, uh, you find that the qualitative component is often quite small or superficial, so it could be just um, a way of you, know, you do some participatory work work and you set a sample. Um, maybe you have some field visits you know, where you're not even entirely convinced the person left their land over. Or what are called qualitative surveys, which actually don't look very quantitative at all. Uh, so I picked a few examples. I won't um, spend a lot of time on them. Um, but I think that they're quite problematic in a number of ways. In the depth of the analysis, um, as a qualitative researcher, it's quite frustrating to um, see something that reports data from apparently from 30 focus groups, but there's actually no analysis of difference between the groups. Uh, and the qualitative data isn't used to look at the very important how question of how this program promoted parental participation. If you want to find more information about what they did, there's an internal report. That's not accessible. <coughs> and it's a similar problem with the second study. Um, you, can't, you can't access, you can't find out how people are making these claims, what these claims are actually based on. And as an example here, the claims are often very strong, finally, based on qualitative evidence from this study. Financial support should be accompanied by the infrastructure and technological services of research centres and universities. You read through the report and you think, where on earth did this come from? And there is no mention of qualitative methods in the methodology. So, I mean, there is perhaps a tendency for people to you know, smuggle their own views under, under this guise of qualitative research. So, qualitative researchers obviously know a number of methodological challenges, which I'm sure many of you will have engaged with. I know that James in particular has done a lot of work on this in designing the quip in his earlier work on microfinance. Um, you face problems of the intellectual biographies or even the personalities of, of the researchers analysing the work and the field work. Um, when you're doing observational work, the quality of note-taking is very important. Um, because obviously if the same people collecting the data are not analysing it, there's a question about how you actually capture people's embodied knowledge, which is tremendously important in understanding what's going on. Um, data management issues with qualitative research, which can often be underestimated, certainly the cost of managing qualitative data. 
Uh, and people might assume that um, if you don't have fantastic notes, it's okay because you have your transcripts and those can be analysed. But obviously, um, there's a further process of mediation when the interviews are transcribed and then again when they're, when they're translated. So what you end up, end up with might be actually very difficult to analyse. I should perhaps have included an example to make the point. So the forms of analysis that take place can essentially be tertiary, if not, you know, so primary analysis, you collect the data yourself and you analyse it. Secondary analysis, you download it from a database with lots of information about how the data was collected and then you analyse it. We might also be almost be looking at tertiary analysis here, in that there's rarely that level of information about how the data was produced. Uh, to enable the um, analyst to analyse it in an intelligent, sophisticated way. Uh, and then, of course, there are further questions about how you represent qualitative data in a credible and interesting way. So moving beyond the quotes and text boxes, and also being sure that you provide um, good evidence for your claims beyond the kind of ethnographic authority which is all that I know. So, to get you thinking about these issues in a new way, I thought I'd have a little look at some of the um, guidance that's given to people who archive data, um, the kind of information that you need to provide for secondary analysts to use your data. And it's, I mean, it's, it's quite a wish list. It's very rare that you have this, if you read a paper, or even if you have a data set that you're trying to analyse which somebody else has collected for you within the same project. It's rare that you have this level of reflection and this level of information. And yet, clearly, these considerations greatly affect what you can do with the data. Um, another way to look at it is to, if you're um, doing a systematic review of quantitative data, there are a number of different appraisal tools out there to help you. And this is an example taken from the National Health Service because there's been a, I think it's fair to say there's a greater expertise in quantitative systematic review and um, various forms like meta narrative and meta synthesis within this field. Uh, and again, it's it's really quite unusual to have answers to these questions, and we might sort of look perhaps at the incentive structures of evaluations within development and ask why that is the question that Patricia was asking. We all know that um, in some cases the work that's being done is not great, and we all know the problems and yet the problems persist. And this is something that um, Richard will address more in his presentation. So when we attempt to, so let's help come up for when we attempt to look at uh, different criteria for validity and reliability um, across quantitative and qualitative research, um, we obviously see that it's not a case that uh, quantitative research has a monopoly on the use of these terms and that there are viable equivalents uh, in qualitative research. I've adapted this from one of you probably, probably recognise it. So uh, we've talked a little bit about things like triangulation. We, talked a bit about fit description and case studies and the way that those enable informed generalisation. What I look at here is how the, trust, the trustworthiness can be increased by providing an audit trail uh, and also the potential of re-studies. So what's, what you might say now is, well surely we have our own solutions already, we don't really need to introduce these, these new modish ideas and we have ethical code here and here, we have citations, and around the table we have people been advocating increased professionalisation of the development industry to try and address these problems. Um, I think that data archiving and research studies can add some additional components, I'll explain why. And firstly, as Richard hinted at, social science ethical codes are typically focused around the care of the subject, although the um, UK government's uh, scientific code is <coughs> quite, inter it's quite interestingly different in this respect. Uh, and of course, not all countries, institutions, disciplines, most notably economics, have ethical codes or committees. Uh, and while um, ethics committees do assess research designs, they don't monitor the data production or presentation. And I know from um, my work on DEVS Ethics Committee, the <coughs> level of comment you can make on the research design is quite limited. There is no sense in which people recognise that going into the field and asking questions that are not, field questions that are not likely to produce data that will answer research questions and um, duplicate work that's been done already and are in other ways a complete waste of respondents' time. I mean, that to me is an ethical issue with working with one of the most sort of, time pressure populations in the world. So um, that's one of the reasons why we're framing these as ethical issues because I think it is quite important. So peer review citations. Well, the first thing to notice is that whilst the practice of depositing data for quantitative papers is growing, it's not universal, this never happens with qualitative data. So a great deal is taken then on trust and reputation. And the same argument can be made, of course, for citations. 
uh, and it is also quite hard to get mixed method studies into you know, the most prestigious journals um, and you face quite strict word limits, which is a bit like Romany, but uh, it is unfortunately the case. Um, more worrying is perhaps the way that grey literature and working papers don't receive the same level of scrutiny, and yet they're still incredibly influential. And in the examples that I gave um, earlier of so-called mixed method studies, there was no kind of audit trail. It was often very hard to establish what had gone on. So clearly some of the procedures that we have already are not working. Um, but what could data archiving offer? And this is something that I find tremendously exciting. I think you can draw methodological insights from it. I think it's an incredible resource to use in teaching. I've, um, I'm teaching a short course in Uganda, and we've really struggled to find qualitative evaluation data that people can work with and through that understand some of the problems um, that uh, come up in analysis. Um, it shows greater respect for respondents' accounts and their time, and of course this issue around judging the validity of claims is important. But of course secondary analysis is difficult to do well, and I find it interesting that I mean, there, are, you know, there are actually whole journal special issues developed, seven or eight, in, within the quantitative field devoted to breastbeating about the terrors of secondary analysis and how on earth do you do it well. And yet it's very much part of, um, part of our practice as course of researchers and development, and it's not really considered to the same degree. So I won't spend a, a great deal of time on these examples. Um, ways in which you can do well, what Richard will just will talk about later, scientific replication, uh, is where you have the opportunity to test the theory against an archived data set and see how different frames, different interpretations could have produced very different conclusions. Um, you can also draw methodological insights. Uh, and to the Gillies and Edwards' aim is not to say um, all the people in Marsden's study were you know, hopelessly bound by their time, they were all sort of racist, sexist, um, classes or whatever, but it's, it's more to say, um, obviously the personalities, the backgrounds of the researchers influence the way that they did their research, um, but perhaps more importantly, this, um, this level of honesty about the way research is done doesn't really exist in contemporary research, where audit practices are stronger, so in fact we've actually lost something by not having, you know, what are, what are almost Malinowski's field diaries in front of us, talking about, you know, how he spent his time moaning about his ill health and fancying the local women. Um, so, re-studies also present quite an interesting area. Uh, and these are not necessarily examples for evaluation practice, but they are way, diff slightly different ways to think about how we engage with data, which I think are useful for evaluation. So, many examples from developing countries, including quite a large ESRC-funded re-study. Uh, and also some controversies, which you're all, all aware of. Um, Freeman versus Mead around adolescent sexuality in Samoa. Uh, Thierry versus um, Chanyon about the, the nature of the Anamami. And where these... Um, Controversies have become particularly heated. I've often been where the original researcher was trying to use their research to make um, particular claims, often about contemporary society, which somewhat overreached the data that they actually had at their disposal. So these all present reasons for why you might restudy. You might want to confirm or disconfirm original findings. And many restudies are, I have to say, a bit on the celebratory side. Um, you might be trying to draw out new insights about your methods used, ways in which they are conceptualized. It's good to have a longitudinal perspective. And also a very few problem for anthropologists is, uh, is they're starting to run out of field sites. So you know, there are pragmatic reasons for doing these studies. Of was really quite different because she engaged with her respondents in very different ways. <coughs> but also the theory that people bring to the site is tremendously influential. And the things that they see or don't see, I mean this is the point with Malinowski and, and, and Weiner, had, had Malinowski been more interested in women's practices and he would have found some, some very interesting things which appear to have been omitted from his original analysis. Uh, so positionality and assumptions are clearly important in evaluation as well. When we look at the different um, other reasons for differences in these studies, uh, this focus is more on historical change. And we, you know, we all understand the attribution problem, that in complex changing environments, it's quite difficult to establish what went on. And I'm not sure actually Boroboy's um, idea of splitting it into internal and external forces actually really holds up when you look at different types of re-studies. Um, but what's quite interesting in his own work in relation to changing environments 
is he, I mean, currently he was studying a factory that had previously been studied by someone called Ray, the gear factory. Um, he studied, you know, he re-studied it, compared his work to gear, and then uh, went back, you know, wanted to go back again to do a re-study. But what would he re-study? His object had changed irrevocably. Um, Allied's operations were now located in Korea, so he'd go back to the sort of now derelict lot and look at the, you know, the communities of um, homeless people who lived there, or look at the <coughs> government's plans to redevelop that lot. But you know, where was what he was? What was he actually re-studying? Um, this has probably moved you know, into, into the realm of academic esoteric <laughs> catching Ben's eye over there. But um, I think these are interesting ideas to think more broadly about the way in which we do our work. So one quite concrete example is a comparison of the work of Audrey Richards, uh, Hen Henrietta Moore and, and Sarah Horn. Uh, it's, I mean, it's an evaluation problem, essentially. It's trying to predict um, what will happen to Bemba society when men migrate to the Southern African mines. And the first prediction was that um, the agricultural system would essentially break down. Uh, and of course, her conclusion is very enthusiastically adopted because essentially, she, she was an ethnographer, not an evaluator, but she was very much telling, telling administrators, chiefs, what they wanted to hear because they obviously wanted a reason to um, suppress this very disruptive system. Uh, but more and more took a slightly different approach, um, albeit 50 years later, which was to challenge the, their terms of reference to say, well, actually, um, is, you know, is the way that this problem framed frame appropriate? Uh, in fact, if we want to understand um, why the agricultural system breaks down, and in fact they argued the agricultural system didn't break down, um, where we should be directing our attention is to the Zambian government's agrarian reforms. Um, but as Borough Boy points out, you know, more of the born had their own uh, intellectual and personal baggage, and you know, if it was slightly to be revisited again another 20 years later, we might see some quite different things. So what lessons can we learn? Um, this is, these are things that we've discussed in the, in the previous <coughs> sessions. So, uh, the, I very much liked the, uh, what's it called? The perspectoscope. The, help me out here. The understander scope. The um, Because that brought out this idea in the need to watch out for interest groups, to be aware of the different perspectives that you're seeing, and also the boundaries. So it's not just about, you know, was the intervention good or bad, but what different people, how different people bound the intervention, and what they see as the intervention. So um, clearly, when we look at the interrelationships, the multiple effects of interventions, um, we can also see the importance of a systemic perspective. <coughs> so, I mean, in this in this particular example, it's obviously you know, not just the, the men and the women who are who are affected. Actually, um, more of Vaughan's work showed that it was children's health that was most affected um, by the changes by the changes in farming practices. So, what broader conclusions can we draw? Well, I hope you'll accept the argument that the quality of research is an an issue. Uh, and the increasing role for qualitative research, or more explicit role for qualitative research in impact evaluation, probably requires increased reflection. Um, but of course, it's very difficult to see what these epistemological and methodological problems are. And I don't think the conventional processes, standards, committees, and so on, are really doing the job at the moment. Um, but obviously, qualitative researchers have their own ideas about how to do this. And um, practices like data archiving and research studies can potentially contribute. Laura, now we'll try to see Okay, well, my Laura gets some more <laughs> nice lines up. Um, well, first of all, I apologize for the fact that I think I'm losing my voice. I've got a good thing. So I uh, hope you can hear what I'm saying, and I'll try and uh, keep the um, microphone up. I actually need to have a loud voice, so I'm just to uh, speak it without assistance. If you um, secondly, um, I, I'm sort of aware, because of the, what's gone on in the last yesterday and this morning, that uh, you know, I'm an academic rather than an evaluator. Of course, I've done lots of evaluations, and so I didn't realise I've been speaking prose all my life. <coughs> Uh, I have been doing evaluations since the days of social cost benefit analysis in the 60s, uh, but not within the context of the evaluation profession. But I think there, are, I, I mean, I do think there is a relevance from the sorts of academic debates that we're going to be talking about to the practice of evaluation, because I do think the distinction between evaluation research or evaluation academia is, an, is largely an artificial. Uh, artificial. Uh, even if you take into account that much of what you may be doing is summative, formative, whereas perhaps we focus more on the summative. But uh, I would uh, urge you to suspend your disbelief that this, uh, uh, what may appear to be rather esoteric argument, 
and so there's not that much relevance to, to you, to carry it. Uh, no, I think I'll have it in the stuff in there. I might have wandered around and stuff like that. Okay. Um, uh, this is going to re uh, rehash some of the stuff you've done before, and I'll try and go through quite quickly. And most of you know about it, and I realise that many people will think that we are fighting the last war. But I'm afraid the last war is, is not over. It's still very much ongoing. We see that in the current fab for uh, um, uh, uh, runaway control plans. We also see it in the continuing prestige of microeconomic tricks and its burgeoning um, uh, power. Uh, we were reminded that it uh, <laughs> came from macroeconomists in the late 1990s and uh, the early 2000s as the dominant discipline in the World Bank affecting uh, official development uh, uh, um, understanding as uh, embodied in World Bank reports and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so I think this war is, is, is ongoing and it's not one that we should get rid of. Okay, so <coughs> one impact evaluation. Uh, in the way that it's formulated, for example, by 3 ie and uh, is supported by the World Bank through its CLEAR initiative and so on and so forth. It addresses the attribution issue uh, and, and it is still very important. For those who wanted to go to contribution analysis, if you ever came anywhere near me, I'd say, well, how do you attribute a contribution? It does, doesn't escape it. It's intellectually vacuous, it seems to me, to say that you can do contribution analysis without making some sort of claim as to why you think that this contribution can be attributed. Uh, uh, maybe someone will be right about that. So, uh, attribution is addressed by a sophisticated econometric analysis of observational data, that is, naturally occurring data, not based on experiments and so on. So, the sort of things we get in large scale surveys and official statistics uh, and so on and so forth. Randomized controls, of course, uh, but also through mixed methods, theory based process based evaluation, agent based modeling and so on basis, and other things we're talking about. And also, this term, phronesis, which is uh, widely popularized, especially when there are certain institution of Oxford, uh, but really stands for expertise. So, uh, uh, anyhow. Um, the methods of modern impact evaluation assert their scientific status uh, through mathematization, <coughs> quantification, claims of neutrality and objectivity, and so on. The old positivist agenda, which I thought uh, we would not find widely repeated more than 50 years after Thomas Kuhn showed that science was a social construct we wanted to. However, in economics, at any rate, uh, and in uh, related uh, quantitative social analysis, whether it's of uh, uh, survey data or participant recruited data, uh, generally lacks one crucial component of science, which is replication. In science, people on the whole don't believe uh, something unless it's been replicated or can be readily replicated. Someone makes a claim about the influence of penicillin on uh, on bugs, uh, they go into their own laboratory and they do it for themselves and they work at it until they find out that, that they get the same results or if they don't get the same results they try to reconcile the uh, reconcile it. But in economics you very seldom see a study repeated, even though it's perfectly possible to take the same data set subject to the same uh, econometric methods and see if you actually get the same results. And people very seldom do it. Um, there have in the past been a lot of difficulties around access to data, which is uh, now much less of a problem, but the ready access to data, um, easy to use econometric software is generating its own problems uh, in the absence of replication or proliferation of apparently sophisticated studies that produce controversial and uh, uh, <coughs> interesting results and so on and so forth. So replication consists of uh, repeatability, being able to do the thing again and get to the similar result, the same result. Checking that uh, the code, the data, actually does produce the tabulated results. Um, looking for internal, external, construct validity, and so on and so forth. These are sort of the standard activities that would, be, uh, uh, that would count as replication within modern social science if it were to be done. Now, as you know, uh, you've already talked about the attribution problem really being the identification problem. That is, how can you identify a causal Factor, something you can say it's causal because of the pervasive problem of confounding. And that is what you, you think may be causing something, may actually be caused by some, something else, which is really what is driving it. Now, so, for example, there's been a long and ongoing controversy about the <coughs> impacts of microfinance. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, have detailed knowledge of it, and I have to declare interest as a participant in this. But 
it, it, you know, in, in the late 1980s, 1990s, it was a the major issue of microfinance was becoming something of a uh, silver bullet uh, in development, uh, particularly uh, also addressing uh, gender issues because one of the predominant findings or one of the, one of the, the, the key institutions of Grameen Bank predominantly lent through women to them and had women representatives on its board. But the uh, problems of identification are captured in what we term placement and uh, selection biases. Placement biases is that pilot projects and early stages of the, uh, the development of institutions such that tend to go to particular places. They tend not to go to your common or garden average place. So if something may work or not work in a particular place for the places they have, but it may not work or work differently or for, uh, work for different people in different ways in different locations. So Robert Chambers, of course, and others uh, involved in the Rapid Rural Appraisal Initiative of the uh, 1970s identified the time the fact that people tended to study um, close to uh, areas that were, uh, in areas that were readily accessible uh, because they didn't have the time or the opportunity or the interest that to pursue more isolated and backward areas. In fact, in the microfinance one, there's a, uh, there's a claim that the early development of microfinance went into particularly disadvantaged areas and therefore it worked there. That claim is not particularly well substantiated with any evidence for the claim of his others. So you may do your studies, your early studies, in areas that are, uh, are not particularly typical and may not typically in ways that are highly relevant. Um, of course, we all know about the pilot project uh, effects where special resources, charismatic leaders, um, uh, undocumented support and so on and so forth were given in the early stages, nominally so that uh, the project can learn and uh, improve, uh, but then the evaluation uh, comes along and fails to take account of the path dependence and the accessible resources, the accessible resources. So, now the selection bias problem is that people who participate in naturally occurring interventions uh, are selected. And they are not necessarily representative of the target group or the population as a whole or whatever you want to know. Generally speaking, the people who participate in pilot projects or in the early stages of the project are people who are more likely to benefit from it. And not all of this, but it is, it is generally the case. Uh, in microfinance, there's always been an underlying thought that the people who participated, and particularly the people who stayed with the microfinance institution, were people who had unobserved uh, energies, abilities, uh, and talents, uh, and motivations that would not be typical of uh, the rest of the population. And therefore, if you were trying to generalize the rest of the population, the information you got from these self-selected people would not really uh, make a good case for what would happen when you uh, got to the poorer or more isolated. So on and, and so forth. So there are these are the two biases that we have to come up with. And we achieve identification, we achieve attribution by a number of ways. We can do it by randomization, providing it's done properly. Uh, but as we know, uh, I won't go into this in great detail because I've been involved quite extensively in various places, there are serious problems about internal and external validity of randomized control. Rate. Just because someone's done a randomized control trial does not mean that it meets the criteria of a high quality randomized control trial. So you look at the medical literature, you see extensive effects <coughs> about the validity of the RCTs and the information that they have. And actually it's very easy to look at some of the reports of social randomized control trials, like randomized controls in naturally occurring in the lab, the sort of things that we do to develop interventions, and they're not in the laboratories or in the, in, the, in the real world. It's very easy if you're ethnographically or sociologically informed to see ways in which it's quite likely that the internal the claim of internal validity may well be one I'll give one example shortly, if I only have time. Of course, the major problem, as we've discussed many times, is external validity, that you could do an experiment in a slum of Hydrogad, but how do you know it's going to work in the slums of uh, Mumbai, or Chennai, or Kolkata, and so on and so forth. Or at a different time, or with a different group, or with a different institution, and so on and so forth. Really, you may need much more extensive experiments to cover a whole population, or the good section of the population, even factorized type of design. And in the absence of randomization, which is the field of most microeconomics, um, or where you have compromised randomized controlled trials or compromised trials of some sort, so we use these econometric methods. We use multiple regression, we use natural quasi experiments, uh, uh, we use instrumental variance of estimation, we use very fashionable nowadays propensity screen matching, uh, which uh, claims to be able to select a control group which approximates the design of a randomized control trial. We use 
the questions that's going to do with panel data estimation and so on. So the sort of thing you need to go to experts for. <coughs> okay, but really what we need to know is how robust these methods. All methods require assumptions, and many of the assumptions require cannot be tested. And very seldom will you see in an econometric report a careful examination of the assumptions that you require. For example, uh, going back to randomization, there are a number of common threats to randomization. Uh, most, uh, one, one of the most pervasive of which is that the, the randomized are not enough subjects, but they're active agents, and then they do things. <coughs> it's a major problem in medical randomized control trials that people self-medicate, and they put the volunteers, that they put themselves for, and they're highly untypical of the major population. Of course, most of them, medical randomized control trials have been done with male prisoners, who are hardly typical of children, for example, and the prescriptions are often are used to transport across, and the randomized controls trials increasingly go to the third world, and into Eastern Europe, where again, a whole other range of issues are affecting I won't go through them because I'm not really going to focus on this. Um, then when you turn to econometric results, where we're looking at observational data or compromise control, randomized control data, we have a number of phenomena that are well known in the business, as I would put it, uh, but are seldom talked about in the evaluation field when it comes to applying these policy methods. And there are things like data mining, result polishing, uh, researcher, sponsor, and editor, allegiance and reluctance, and harking. Uh, well, of course, we all know what data mining is. You know, if you put a, uh, if you um, create a hundred random variables and then create a correlation matrix between them, five percent of those, five of them, will show up to be statistically significant just by chance. And of course, if you do enough regressions, you may well come across significant results. And then you get into the business saying, well, how can I rationalize this? Or how can I improve it so that it supports the hypothesis that I'm quite keen on? And that gets the issue of allegiance uh, and reluctance. Allegiance is that people have prior beliefs. People who are doing research on microfinance uh, might like to think of themselves as neutral, but it's quite clear that they have a strong commitment because they bought into the uh, Mohammed Yunus Grameen Bank etc, etc, empowerment, etc. Uh, it, it, it ticks lots of boxes, it's very easy to believe it, and we want to believe it, we have a positive bias, as the behavioral economist is shows. Um, reluctance is of course the reverse of that, that is that people may be reluctant to pursue results that are not consonant with their prior beliefs. They may say, oh well, that's an exception, I don't use that data set, or I will manipulate the data set, or manipulate the estimation in some sort of way, so I no longer get that. And Harking is hypothesizing after result is no. So you can do an analysis and then you can create, a, 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 create an explanation around it, a story around it. And if you put these things together, you, you get what is well known, is that many more positive results being published than negative results in our economics papers and so on and so forth. Um, okay, I won't go through the slide, but I just recommend that you read that Bernie Galway goes bad form. If you haven't read their bad science, it's excellent book on the and bad form continues. <laughs> Uh, at least conclusion at the end of this, as I think many of you will know, is that uh, because of some of the problems I've been talking about, there is a requirement for a register that all studies should be registered in advance, so that we don't get a selection in the file or problem, etc., etc. And I'm sort of on board of saying, well, all uh, evaluations, all econometric results, etc., et uh, analyses should be registered, so we know how many get dropped along the way, uh, and maybe do some sort of analysis. Now when we get to observational studies, we have three types of replication. Uh, we have pure replication, which is just the checking. And that checks for problems in the data, have they got the decimal place in the right place, have they got outline observations which are very influential, particularly other coding errors. And we'll see coding errors are pervasive. Uh, any uh, any uh, experienced coder will know that there's very seldom any foolproof, uh, flaw-free set of code. And, and much of the code required to produce these complicated analyses are hundreds of thousands. Uh, or, uh, sorry, thousands of lines long, and very seldom do people go, go through them and check that they produce the results. Uh, there's statistical replication where you say, well, if I get this result for this sort of data set, then I should get the same sort of result with this data set. So, for example, if I get this result with the Bangladesh Household Income Expenditure Survey from 1995 to 1996, I should get it from 1991, 1992, and 2000, 2001, and subsequently. Or you should some sort of expect. One of my colleagues said, I don't get the same result in the next data set. He said, oh, well, there's probably some change that has really happened in the real experience. I said, well, what's the change? You no, know, well, no, well, there's nothing. I don't, you know, I don't see that this would particularly happen. If it works for Bangladesh, it will also work for West Bengal in many cases, or we should be able to explain it and so on and so on. So you should be able to apply it to a different data. It should be robust to the use of economic software. 
for, uh, to different uh, data processing software. It should be robust to plausible recalculation. If you want to calculate income as a result, or if you want to calculate uh, uh, consumption expenditure as a result, it's widely, widely used, or an index of impairment, for example. It should be robust to various alternative constructions for those particular variables. Thank you. And again, a lot of code is involved in that, and uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, without access to that, it's very hard to know what's going on. And then the scientific replication, which asks the question, well, is it robust to the next best alternative theory? Not is it better than nothing, having got a coefficient of statistical <coughs> or not, but is it different from a coefficient that we would get if we use a different type of model to try and explain what is, what is going on? And very seldom do you see you know, we just see a one maintain a that's what's going on. So what are our experiences from what I call replication world of practice? Now, I mean, it turns out that I've been doing obvious before it was called what, what I call it replication. Uh, because the first part of any sort of study seems to me uh, in, in microcology is, is well, what did the people do before? I'm always following on from somebody else. You know, how did they do it? Do I really understand what they did? And of course, most of the published works you see do not contain all the information. In sort of computational science, people would say the real work is in <coughs> is not in the published paper, it's in the background. First of all, um, many people would say that some people are picking edges of the field and having to deal with them. So there's more application than I realize. Actually, I don't think there is more application than I realize. Because many people embark on it in the same motivation that I had, which was to see, you know, do I really understand what people are doing? And then they discard it because they can't. You, you can't actually produce the results that other people produce at all easily, for reasons I'll mention later on. But more importantly, as well, is the low incentives for replication. Partly because it's difficult to do, very time consuming. You know, if you don't get the same result as someone else, and you don't know what exactly they did because they don't tell you, they don't give the code, or it's not explained properly, etc., etc. You know, it's a detective piece of work. You know, they did it just once off, but you've got to reconstruct it without having their implicit knowledge, <coughs> their ways of doing things, and so on. Difficult, difficult to access data and code. Repeating analysis is very taxing, and then there are publication biases, which uh, people say, well, if you replicate it successfully, so what, you know, it, it, not much credibility. Several journals have said, we will publish successful replication, but in general case, they have. And then there are the terrors. Uh, many people say, ask you, well, why are you trying to replicate what I'm doing? I mean, what's your motive? Oh, you're trying to knock down my reputation. You've got an unfortunate personality. And so on and so forth. <laughs> so there are people who say, you have adversarial intentions. They could be political. We'll come across an example where you said that somebody was uh, associated with the labour unions, the teachers of the union, and they did their cover of study that said that uh, charter schools weren't working. Well, charter schools were opposed by the labour unions, and so they, they, they attributed political adversarial views. Uh, to advance your career, I mean, you advance your career by knocking down some, down some um, peer who has a high reputation, and they also attributed a lack of originality. I mean, why are you repeating a study? Uh, that, that, that you know, has uh, established problems because you can't think of anything to do for yourself. Well, my response to that is, well, perceiving that something may be flawed seems to be quite a creative thing when it turns out that rather a lot of them are flawed. And then you encounter belligerent um, a refutation by original authors. I mean, economists, I don't know how many we are, but can behave very badly uh, to each other. And can be, you know, <laughs> as well as one of our people, of course. Uh, they get up, they scribble algebra and say, that shows it. Well, I was taught by Joan Robinson, who used to say that, and said, well, I can say that in a few words, all the algebra you put up in there, and was very good at putting down people who blinded you to mathematics and quantification and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, and we have examples of it. Okay. So, peer checking. Okay, here are some examples. Uh, uh, Feldstein, who won a Nobel Prize for economics, made a coding error mistake, which was crucial to the results he got, which was pointed out by Lesnar, uh, Lionel Lesnoy. And Feldstein responded by you know, owning up. He put his hand up. There had been a little controversy before in the newspapers about it. But you know, he, he was not belligerent in his response, but he, he did what many people who had their work to replicate do. He came forward with a new argument, <coughs> which said, but I'm right or anyhow. Uh, and this involves, of course, if you're an editor and you have a paper that you wish to publish and make the result, and you encounter by original author that says, yes, but the result stands anyhow, you have to debate whether you really want to publish this or not, and you get involved in long rounds about whether it's really right. Uh, Stephen Levitt, uh, the, um, in his book, anyhow, um, got involved in a little lawsuit with somebody who he criticised, uh, claiming that his work was not replicated. 
Uh, uh, Hawksbury and Rothstein is the example about the labor union motivated one. Uh, Hawksbury responding in a very belligerent way, uh, accused him of misreporting his results, misreporting his correspondence with her, and so on and so on. And it results in a long delayed publication. And for a graduate student, that's very easy. Be very uh, scary months on your academic career. More recently, uh, Darren Oster, Asimov, and Albury, David Albury, have been involved in a belligerent contestation that has resulted in even longer delay. In that. And uh, Asimov is extremely influential in the development of the uh, uh, economics at the moment because he claims that historical institutions have a long, institutions have a long lasting effect, have a very important effect on uh, outcomes. Um, okay. Uh, in my own experience uh, of a randomized control study, uh, Dean Carl and, and Zinkman uh, produced a well-reported uh, randomized control trial uh, in which it's quite clear from reading their accounts that there was a high level selection bias scale. It was so obvious that you wonder how they would have managed to get published. So reading carefully can reveal flaws if you want to do it. In terms of observational studies, I did work on the real wages of agricultural laborers uh, following Martin Rebellion's work with Jim Boyce where they showed that real wages were declining in the 1980s. Uh, and it was quite clear from my uh, everyday experience in zero months. Okay. Um, I'll do just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. There, there are a number of, yeah, there are a number of uh, examples which you could go through where, in fact, we find major flaws in development, influential development studies publications. Uh, either uh, we found that during checking, whether we look at the Jetson Foster paper, or more controversially, <coughs> the Britain Canker claim about the benefits of medical medicine, especially as low for women. I think nowadays the consensus, although it's very contested by Mark Britt very belligerently, I think the conclusion is that the evidence is just not there from the data set that we used. But it was a widely quoted by and proven by Mahal Yunus in 2005 and received the Nobel Prize. Okay, we'll have to skip through this. I mean, one of the points, and I think going into more detail about that, one of the points I wanted to make was that Pitt and Kanker's evaluation was not really about Arsenal's impacts, but it was about inputs almost into a product. And if people borrow more from a microfinance product, that is no evidence that it empowers them in any sense of it. It merely means the project is having some sort of, is doing something, it's doing what's pretty. We don't know whether that has positive effects to this side or negative effects. That's how we now know that some women who borrow money did get their arms broken and their uh, assets taken away and uh, seem to have been impoverished, um, <coughs> offset against the inspiring stories of women who borrow and then send their children to university. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to this. We don't have time. Okay. What about the conclusions? Well, the conclusion broadly is that much higher economics is much more fragile than the prestige and status and power of economics claims for itself and is awarded in the number of race top dog. I mean, uh, I don't like to be nasty about how White, who's a board graduate of our university, and a personal friend and so on, I like, but he came there and talked to us one time, and his first opening statement was, well, if you want to have any influence in development, become an economist. Um, I don't agree with that. I think if you're going to be an economist, you should be an ethnographically or a methodologically rigorous one. But some people have known that economics is very weak for a long time. So Edward Lima, who's a pretty made up member of the profession, wrote a paper called Let's Take the Corner Out of Econometrics uh, way back in 1983. In fact, the original work is considerably further than that. I uh, is a medical researcher uh, that claims that most published research, statistical published research, are in fact false because of the results of things like research, results polishing, selection, um, publication bias, and so on and so forth. Uh, Nansky, who's been around for a long time and very influential, claims that the use of economic results for policy analysis requires incredible degrees of belief in the validity of the assumptions. Quite, I mean, he means incredible in the sense that they're not credible. And then you find out about by looking at the detail of the way in which the work is conducted by replication. Uh, what we find in the development industry, probably, is that power speaks to uh, truth. I mean, uh, the development pressure is, for, uh, is, is, is as fee dependent, uh, as uh, I mean, job dependent, uh, and people are, have these motivations in what they are doing. I uh, have a little diagram in the following page, which speaks to a, a model of an industry that comes out of work by David Lewis and Curtis Gardner from 1996, which tries to point out the interests of people. Now, we all know from bureaucracies that their main objective is, uh, their, their objectives are not necessary, <coughs> but are their mandates. And they are to uh, maintain themselves in business, as we see nowadays with voluntary organizations and the oppressive regime. 
you know, desperately trying to preserve themselves in some sort of way, even contracting uh, for services that they wanted to provide for free as well. But I used to present this to my students until an uh, African <coughs> master student said, well, you know, Richard, there's something that's missing here. What's missing are the academics. So what's the role of the academics? I, I hope time I produced much more complicated by that. Okay? Interests involved in what I call the uh, development industry. It is an industry. It's a market. You know, it may be a, not, not a, a typical market, but it is a market. There are various suppliers and there are various commanders and the funders and the gap between the funders and the other. But anyhow, in the middle, there are, not, there, there are two groups represented here, the, the development academics and the consultants. Well, the thing about it is, is that you know, we do these things like participate through the rural proto or um, um, water users associations or other types of uh, women's empowerment projects. We do them because you academics tell us that they're the right things to do. But, you know, there is a degree of belief in the rigor and respectability and reliability of the work that academics do. It's not really justified. Well, it's not justified, but it's not where any acknowledge is. It's not acknowledged it's because of cognitive bias. <laughs> Again, the wonderful chapter by Ben Goldberger, chapter 12 in Bad Science, as to why clever people do stupid things. Uh, typified in the Guardian report about people who were not getting their children the triple vaccine. And they, and they said, you know, it was the most intelligent people who were not giving the children the, 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 the vaccine because they knew that as long as everybody else did it, their children would be protected and they wouldn't have to worry about the most intelligent. Well, I'm not sure the Guardian Unions are the most intelligent, just by being one by itself, but they're also the most stupid because, of course, if you do it, other people do it, and other people will follow you, other people take the same decisions, etc. And we have what we have today, which is uh, uh, epidemics of measles and death by measles as a result of uh, following this rather than um, this way of doing So uh, we see patterns uh, where there are analyses, all the lessons of behavioral economics or behavioral psychology from Canada and University of Online. We see patterns where there are none. We see causal relations where there are none. We overvalue con evidence which confirms what we uh, believe. We value it more favorably, evidence that conforms with our beliefs, and we seek out confirmation. All well-known biases, I think. And this intersects with professional interests and the avoidance of cognitive damage bias. So another well-known thing is we don't like to be conflicted. We don't have, like, we can't have split personalities. Um, and what we find in economics is that the the power of economic policy, the validity, is part of the disciplinary doctor, the doxa. It's, it's actually a, a, a belief that you have to have in order to conduct this. It's part of the everyday habitus. You know, you're taught it, you're, it's esoteric, it's difficult, uh, it's demanding, you have to have skills, you have to have persistence, and so on and so on. But in regard to the fragility, I think the economics profession is in a state of denial. I mean, it was quite good for me to read Stan Cohen's uh, book about states of denial with regard to the Holocaust and other things. So if you look at the way my communist friends and colleagues often uh, <coughs> uh, deny the problem. And they say, oh, it's, it's trivial. There's only a few exceptional cases. Now, it's every case I've ever come across that I've been interested in. Okay, maybe it's a reflection of bias there because I tend to start because I, I see the problem with what people can do. But I want to end by saying that you know, so with the trope that, in a sense, started this off, uh, I sort of noticed that, well, sociology and anthropology and you know, things have ethics in the forms of informed consent and you sign up to ethics. But there's nothing like that when you start up to an economic university. You don't sign up to something saying, I'm going to do a good job. But in, the, uh, in sociology, you know, there's no proof that they did a good job. You don't know whether somebody used leading questions, for example, or dressed in such a way as to elicit the sort of response. Or they mined their data for quotes that cherry pick the results and say, oh, well known with model. Howard has written about this in the article of World Development uh, about methodology. But economists, they don't have any ethics. There's no ethical codes for an ethics examining. But we do have the possibility of replication. We could restudy things quite readily. We could so test them. Ten minutes off the study. That's what this is. Okay, so I wanted to kind of give us a line about ethics. Um, and the last slide suggests that we should be just caught to the emerging consensus that comes from the medical model. Uh, and that is that uh, we need to look at uh, uh, ethics in a more broader sense. We need to uh, take the rigor of science as an ethical issue rather than one that is, in a sense, guaranteed by peer review. So we all know peer review is a flawed process. We should be prepared to publish negative or null results. It's important to find a way of doing that. And we really should uh, enable replication. Thanks very much to Lauren Richard.
for this uh, incredibly interesting paper session. And now uh, we should uh, group into the um, breakout rooms as we did yesterday. Uh, but